Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I'm Ann Thayer, Contributing Editor to the CNEN Media Group, and I'll be moderating today's event. This webinar is entitled Novel Peptide Hit Identification and Lead Generating Strategies for Drug Discovery, and is being sponsored by Wuxi Aptek. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience and consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the Help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you're disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You're encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I'll be posing as many as time permits. Please note that CNEN doesn't endorse any company products or services that may be mentioned in the webinars, and that each webinar will be archived at CNEN Online after the live webcast. The presentation today is being sponsored by Wuxi Aptech. Wuxi Aptech provides a broad portfolio of R&D and manufacturing services that enable companies in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device industries worldwide to advance discoveries and deliver groundbreaking treatments to patients. With industry-leading capabilities such as R&D and manufacturing for small molecule drugs, cell and gene therapies, and testing for medical devices, Wuxi Aptech's open access platform is enabling more than 4,200 collaborators from over 30 countries to improve the health of those in need and to realize the company's vision that every drug can be made and every disease can be treated. During the presentation, we'll hear from three speakers. First will be Andrew Routon, Executive Director of Medicinal Chemistry in the Research Service Division at Wuxi Aptech. Dr. Routon contributed to discovery and early development programs across multiple therapeutic areas at Pharmacopeia, Dalton Pharma, and in Psychotherapeutics for small molecule and peptide-based agents. He undertook doctoral studies at the Max Planck Institute in Mülheim, Germany, and postdoctoral studies at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. Our second speaker will be Professor Graham Ogg, who developed the Orbit Peptide Bead Display technology in his laboratory at the MRC Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine, Oxford University. He co-founded Orbit Discovery to industrialize the platforms towards develop deployment of highly diverse peptide libraries in discovery of target binding peptides and also capitalizing on the nature of bead display to discover functional hits using live cell screening. And we'll hear from Hui Liao, Associate Director of the Chemistry Service Unit at Wuxi Aptech. She joined the Peptide Center in 2018 and has been actively managing multiple fee-for-service and full-time equivalent projects at the discovery stage. Prior to joining Wuxi Aptech, she obtained her PhD from The Ohio State University, where her major interest was in the discovery of novel cyclic peptides for studying protein-protein interactions. And with that, I'll now hand things over to Dr. Routon. Welcome to Novel Peptide Hit Identification and Lead Generating Strategies for Drug Discovery. I'm Andrew Routon. We have a handful of topics today we'd like to present. Novel Peptide Discovery and Drug Space, Peptide Hit Finding, Differentiated Display and Functional Screening, advanced optimization strategies and practical tips, and up-and-coming peptide agents. So from insulin to lutetium 177 lu there's a century of peptide discovery and development. We have here a number of examples, beginning with insulin on the far left from Banting, Best, and McLeod, and then through, especially from the 50s forward, several peptide agents. They fall into different classes, as you can see, according to the color-based legend. In particular, items that come from natural products, items that have been made through medicinal chemistry optimization, items that come from display technologies, which Graham will tell us about shortly. I think the key features as we look at the century here, um, from my perspective as a chemist, would be certainly the 1963 invention of solid phase peptide synthesis from Merrifield, but also highlighting the key features of recombinant technologies that have uh, begun in the 80s and carried us through to today, an ever-increasing number of key 
peptide discoveries and agents on the far right-hand side have really been addressing what have been traditionally the barriers to peptide discovery. And again, we'll touch on those features with Graham and Hui as we go through the presentation. So as examples of the modality today, protein-protein interactions are a key class of challenging drug targets. We have examples here on the left for PD-1, PDL-1. In this instance, the macrocyclic peptide that you can see on the left-hand side is candidate. Uh, multiple N methylations of the amid moieties, which is a key feature that we'll talk about during the presentation. There's a thioether cyclization juncture. The X ray crystal structure actually shows the nice ring type shape of the macrocycle on the surface of PDL1. This is a very prominent target, of course, due to the number of uh, cancer types that are being addressed by biologics currently. Another example comes from the GPCR space where we have CXCR4. Its interaction with CXCL12, the macrocycling case here from poly4 in Basel, uh, really highlights, I think, nicely the platform chemistry devoted to the beta hairpin turn with a bridging disulfide as well. Next example comes from the antiviral space. We have an example here called Bolevertide. This is a first in class entry inhibitor for hepatitis delta virus HDV and hepatitis B. This agent is a linear 47 amino acid species, I think um, comprised largely of natural amino acids. I would highlight the bottom right-hand side where there is a lipidation strategy in place here, the Mirstruil, and uh, underscore that this is exactly the kind of modification that we'll touch on later with Hui's presentation. But this is a, a, an interesting first-in-class entry to antiviral peptide space. The final example before I pass the presentation on to Graham is for type 2 diabetes, semaglutide. This is an interesting development of the peptide space through a large group of GLP-1 agonists that have been investigated over the years. It was realized in the early 1990s that this key GLP-1 agent was responsible for uh, the increase in insulin secretion. And the Novo Nordisk team spent quite a bit of time optimizing key features, one of which involves a non-natural, non-protonogenic amino acid, the amino acid butyric acid substitution, to increase stability, which addresses one of the key features of peptides that uh, over the years have been recognized as uh, an issue to solve. In addition, the team has also made use of hydrophilic linkers and hydrophobic spacing here. In the case of the fatty acid lipid tail that's been appended to a lysine residue, in this case, this speaks to a strategy that looks to binding to albumin to increase the pharmaceutical properties of the agent, rendering it something that has stability on the order of seven days for half-life and enabling the once-weekly subcutaneous injection for this uh, agent. Interestingly, more recently, the same Novo Nordisk team has identified an oral administration plan for this agent. Ribelsis is its name. And in this case, it's a question of a formulation that includes the agent known uh, colloquially as SNAC. It's uh, an enhancer for the solubility and uh, plays on local pH, leads to increased drug solubility, and essentially protecting it against proteolysis. This agent was approved in uh, September 2019, again, as an oral administration drug for diabetes. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for the kind invitation to talk uh, today at the Wuxi Abtec webinar series. I've thoroughly in enjoyed it so far, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. We developed a novel peptide display technology, which was spun out uh, through Orbit Discovery, which is also based in Oxford, approximately three kilometers from where I have my academic lab. So I've been able to maintain close connections. And at Orbit, we've developed and apply innovative drug di discovery platforms defined by a unique peptide display engine 
that delivers novel, functional and biologically relevant peptide therapeutic leads. And I'd like to highlight on that the functional aspect. We display peptides around a bead, which I'll present in a moment, and that allows us to access screening using live cells for binding, but also progressing through to functional analysis during the primary screen. This audience needs no introduction to the versatility of peptides. They're very common biological molecules, and therapeutics have the potential to influence target biology function from agonist through to antagonist, can prevent ligand binding to target through disruption of protein-protein interaction, can be utilized to develop peptidomimetic or small molecule drugs, and as you described, Andrew, they can be used as a cell targeting a cargo delivery, for example, radionuclide labels and other cargoes. There are a number of peptide display engines, all of which link genotype to phenotype, and they do this through a number of different mechanisms, including through phage, yeast, bacteria. And bacteria includes cyclops, intracellular, screening approach, ribosomal, mRNA, DNA binding, and a bead display, which I'll present in a moment. But of these, phage display and mRNA display have achieved most commercial traction. And I'll discuss those briefly to provide the context before coming on to talk about bead display. For phage display, peptides are presented on the surface of the phage, which are then used to pan across typically a recombinant target. The phage that binds to that recombinant target can be isolated, they can be sequenced and then amplified for subsequent rounds of selection. This is a very well-established technology used in both commercial and academic settings. Large library sizes are possible and some modified structures are possible as exemplified by bicycle therapeutics. However, there are a number of disadvantages or at least limitations. For example, it's difficult to incorporate non-natural amino acids. It's not impossible, but it's challenging. And there can be transformation and replicative bias, meaning that the library isn't necessarily accurately amplified during each round of selection. And currently, phage display is mainly limited to affinity screening, in other words, binding screening, rather than looking for a functional consequence of the phage binding to a target. At the heart of mRNA display is the linkage of an mRNA via puromycin to the peptide encoded by that RNA. Non-natural amino acids and cyclic structures can be incorporated as exemplified by peptidrine. And the, uh, the nucleic acid peptide complex is then again panned across a target molecule. The, the, the complexes that bind are isolated, are identified, and can be amplified for the subsequent rounds of screening. There are many advantages of mRNA display, including really very large library sizes, the incorporation of non-natural amino acids and some modified structures, as I described. But again, there are some limitations. There's a potential for replicative bias, uh, that the single valency of linkage between peptide and RNA means that that accesses some target space, but not complete target space, as I'll describe later. Largely, uh, mRNA display is limited to affinity or binding uh, screening rather than functional screening. And there are steps along this pathway where there uh, may be vulnerabilities to RNA instability, such that the whole library may not be accurately encompassed through all rounds of screening. At Orbit, we link genotype to phenotype around a bead surface, where each bead is a member of a library, for example, up to 10 to the 9. And each bead has multiple copies of a, its own unique stretch of DNA. That DNA can come from a random library, or it can come from a biased or structured library in some way. And using in vitro transcription translation, we then generate the peptide encoded by that DNA and link that back to the bead. And that this is an in vitro transcription translation approach, it gives us a number of particular capabilities. For example, we can configure the structure in, in some sophistication. For, for example, we can have tens of peptides through to tens of thousands of peptides per bead. The peptide confirmation can be linear through to cyclic, and, and cyclic structures are our workhorse uh, peptide display system. We can express a range of different peptide sizes through to just a few amino acids, through to whole proteins. So, for example, we've encoded protein um, antibodies on the surface of the beads. We can incorporate non-natural amino acids translationally, as I'll describe in a moment. And we can also introduce post-translational modifications. And as the beads are an inanimate structure, we can perform on bead chemistry and we can modify the structure of the, the, the peptides uh, and expose them to conditions that might be relevant for particular targets, for example, low endosomal pH. 
So this is how we make the bead library. We capitalize on the capabilities of microfluidics and the formation of water and oil emulsions where each uh, water and oil emulsion is a micro compartment separated from its neighbor. And within each of those, we place a, 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 a bead and also a piece of DNA from the library. We then undertake emulsion PCR so that we amplify and then link back multiple copies of that stretch of DNA around each bead, which is separated from its neighbor. On the third bead along there, we have in vitro transcription translation where we convert that DNA into the peptide or protein encoded by that DNA and link that back to the bead. So now each bead, as I mentioned, has up to many thousands of copies of DNA and many thousands of copies of the peptide or protein encoded by that DNA. And then we can take that bead and either add that to a recombinant target molecule for, for affinity screening. But importantly, we can also run that bead across live cells, looking for binding to live cells. But also because the beads are multivalent, we can also induce functional response in those cells and detect that through reporter systems. And we determine which beads have, have either bound to the cell or uh, induced a functional response in the cell by sequencing the DNA on the bead. We can then use that to identify particular motifs expressed by the peptide or protein, and we can do multiple rounds of screening. So at Orbit, we do two forms of screening. The first is affinity or binding screening, and the second is live cell screening. And I've got a couple of slides on each of those to exemplify how, how we do those screens. So the first is the affinity or binding screening, where we simply take our library of beads that are expressing the peptides and the DNA, and we mix those with targets. Typically, we label those targets with a, a fluorescently labeled antibody. The beads that bind to the particular fluorescent target, then acquire that fluorescence, and we can identify those using flow cytometry. We can sort the, the, the beads that are bound to the target using a, a flow-based system, and we can regenerate the beads, amplify, and do multiple rounds of screening. And this is very rapid, so each round takes a few days, so we can do three rounds of screening, which is our typical workhorse system, uh, within three to four weeks. And this gives a, a number of additional capabilities because in the same selection, step, we can include more than one target. For example, you might want one target, which is the wild type, and another target, which is the, uh, the, the a mutant version. Each can be linked to different fluorescent markers, and then you would sort either one color or both colors to identify selectivity and specificity during the primary screen. So this data shows some example uh, screen and uh, outputs that we obtain. Uh, we can screen comfortably between 200 million and a billion bead si library size. Each round of screening is shown there in the facts plots, and then the cumulative data shown on the right. But uh, for each round, you can see the beads that are bound to the uh, the fluorescent target as the right-hand half of each of those fast plots. After the first round, we see a few beads binding. We isolate those, amplify, and, and place those into a new bead library for the second round, and then through to the third round. And in this particular example, we spiked in a control sequence, and we can see that after the third round, 30% of the beads that are binding to the target are of the, of the control sequence. And as well as spiking in control sequences, we can also look for the emergence of peptides from the random components of the library. So in this particular example, we made a, a library that was biased around a known peptide binding motif shown up there in, in red at the top. And as I said, we can either have completely random libraries or we can have them biased around known motifs to look for enrichment of, of particular characteristics. And in this particular screen, the vast majority of the top 200 hits uh, did show uh, compatibility with this motif. And I've just shown the top 10 here uh, to illustrate that, that the outputs that we get. And we found an additional capability here that this system can also be used for a rapid triaging of the initial hits before going on to uh, chemical peptide synthesis and more um, um, intensive analysis such as uh, surface plasma resonance. And, and we do that by making beads expressing pure members of the, the hit. So on the bottom left FAPS plot there, we've made beads all expressing mutant one. And we can see that all of those beads are able to bind to the fluorescent target. And the same there on the bottom right with mutant four. So we can very rapidly uh, triage and confirm hits that we've picked up during the screens before going on to a more um, uh, resource intensive uh, uh, next steps. And another filter that we 
have introduced in our modeling department is to make structural predictions of the hits based on any known peptide structures. So here we've compared a particular hit uh, with a known structure of a known peptide, and then we can, on the basis of uh, predicted interactions and, and desired characteristics, go on to choose the ones that we want to progress to next steps. And I mentioned that we can incorporate non-natural amino acids and cyclic structures. This slide shows examples of incorporation of non-natural amino acids done in two different ways. The green uh, fluorescent bar within A uh, on the left there shows a bodily labeled cysteine incorporation within a peptide. And the second uh, green uh, fluorescent uh, column there, you'll note a, a blue upper aspect to that uh, band, uh, that particular peptide is incorporated not only a bodily labeled cysteine, but also a blue labeled azetophenylalanine incorporated using codon reassignment. So we can incorporate non-natural amino acids using a number of different approaches, and we can incorporate more than one non-natural amino acid within each peptide. And in addition to doing affinity or binding screening, we can also probe live cells, as I mentioned, and, and specifically to look for functional uh, responses in those live cells. And here again, we return to the microfluidic system. Here on the, on the left, you can see a, a, an image, it's a dynamic image, there's a stream of droplets forming uh, through to the right of that image. And feeding into that, we have two inputs. We have cells coming through one channel and uh, beads coming through another channel. And the cells have got a GFP reporter linked to, uh, to a particular GPCR. And on the right there, you'll see a still image of the output that we would obtain. Those beautiful circles are each micro droplets, water and oil micro droplets separated from the neighbor. And you'll see that some have got large green uh, cells for which the report has been activated. And if you get your eye in, you'll see that some of the droplets also have got beads in them. And if the bead expresses the right peptide to induce a functional response in that GPCR expressing cell, we detect that through the GFP induction and can identify the beads that are bound to uh, that, that particular cell and induce the functional response during the primary screen. And in addition to using droplet system for functional screening, which has enormous diversity. So for example, we can produce droplets at several thousand per second. We also, when we have a more limited library where we're looking for rich biological data, like to use a plate-based system. And here in each of these wells, we have our reporter cells in this example with a GPCR linked to a GFP reporter again. And we place different numbers of beads and different types of beads in each, in each well. And then we simply look for the wells that uh, show the fluorescent signal and that typically as you can see here, has a good signal-to-noise ratio. But having this system in uh, uh, different wells allows additional capabilities. So for example, it's easy to control conditions in different wells. You might have different pH uh, levels, for example. You might have different uh, co-stimulatory or co-inhibitory factors present at the time of the screen. One can look at bias agonism. So one can have reporters linked to different pathways to look at different signaling method mechanisms. And it's also possible to produce peptide off B, and this is possible both in the droplet and in the plate-based system. So that now peptide, as well as being attached to the bead, is also present in the supernatant of the wells or the droplets. So this opens up a number of possibilities of investigating, for example, self-penetrating peptides, internalization, and intracellular targets. And it can also potentially allow examination of protein-protein interactions. I've described a number of different approaches to high throughput peptide display, including the very powerful phage display and mRNA display. We believe that the B display system does have those capabilities, but also extends to new target reach and new biology by being able to screen against live cells. It may be that certain targets are only in their correct conformation in situ in a cell membrane, so it allows access to a, a, a wider target reach. But importantly, the B system can induce a functional response in the cells, so it allows us to access very rich sources of biological data during the primary screen. In, in summary, we believe that the bead display system will allow reach to new target space and to examine functionality in the primary screen. I can answer questions at the end of the seminar, but if you prefer to email, then please do. And, but once we've identified the candidate hits, then we would engage with expert partners such as Hui at Wuxi to help progress through to novel therapeutics. Thank you, Graham, for the interesting overview of the display technologies and in particular the Orbit Discovery platform with a, a number of key advances over earlier generation technologies. 
very exciting as we transition into the next stage of SAR development and techniques from Huey want to focus a bit on peptide pros and cons in general. Um, there have over the years been a number of folks recognize how important and key the affinity and selectivity of peptides can be as agents. Typically there's not an issue with aqueous solubility. Uh, there are a number of natural ligands, endogenous ligands that are peptides that can be used as templates. All of these contribute to what folks consider to be the positive aspects of peptide modality. On the other hand, what I think the field has really been challenged to overcome over the years have been stability, um, metabolic stability, uh, protease stability, permeability, cell uptake, and oral bioavailability. Thankfully, more recently, a lot of the techniques that we've actually touched on earlier in Hui will underscore in her presentation speak to ways to get around some of these challenges on the stability and the permeability and the uptake and have led a number of labs in both academic settings and in industry to increase the numbers of investigationals and indeed produce additional new novel medicines. With that, I'll pass over to Ray. Hey, Andrew, thanks very much. Um, in general, the HEs identified from initial screening only exhibit moderate affinity and specificity. So here, my talk today will focus majorly on further optimization and adding some drug-like properties, as well as how to overcome the synthetic difficulties. So first, here are a few directions you may think about. The very first one is to replace the natural amino acids with non-proteogenic amino acids. The second one is to convert your linear sequence into a cyclic one. The third one is to add some other units, such as sugars, tag units, as well as lipids, to change its original hydrophobicity profile. And the last one is to add some desired functional group, such as cell-penetrating peptides, to let your peptide have the desired function. So for each optimization direction listed here, I will have a detailed slide to show you how they look like. First, let's look at what non-proteogenic amino acids are. Take phenylalanine as an example. Naturally, the amino acids are L configuration like this. Then directly after the chiral center on alpha carbon, this results in the D configuration. If the aromatic side chain is converted into saturated hexane group, it will result in the side chain mimetics. Further, adding one more methyl group on the amine here, this results in the group called unmethylated amino acid. And unmethylation is in general related to better PK characteristics and oral availability. Lastly, in order to cyclize peptides via cyclic or RCM, it is required to introduce the amino acids containing azide, arcine, arcine groups like these. The previous slides give you a few examples based on four categories. This slide here gives you a broader collection of special amino acids. Basically, if one molecule contains one amine and one carboxylic acid, this one can be considered as one amino acid. Then the side chain can be developed into any desired structure you want. These amino acids can be alpha, beta, or gamma amino acids. As you can see, this collection really expands the chemical diversity of synthetic peptides. Currently, there are more than 10,000 special amino acids reported in literature, and more than 25% of them are commercial available. The second direction is macrocyclization. As you can see from the examples in the beginning of this webinar, there have been multiple successful macrocyclics existing on market. Currently, there are more than 50 cyclic peptides under clinical study, and more are in the discovery stage. 
compared to the linear version. Cyclization allows the peptide to form a pre-organized structure, and the cyclic peptide shows improved affinity, specificity, stability, and sometimes better cell permeability as well. Regarding the cyclization strategy, standard amide cyclization is very common. Besides amide cyclization, disulfide, RCM, click, cell ether, and many other strategies have been well documented with feasibility. And then about the ring size, specifically refer to the number of amino acids in the ring structure. Four to 40 amino acids have been reported. If the sequence contains less than four or greater than 40 amino acids, the synthesis would be quite challenging, and the success rate will be sequence dependent. On this slide, there are three monocyclic peptides and one bicyclic peptide. In practice, the sequence can contain one, two, three, or even four ring structures. Obviously, the more ring structure it contains, the higher complexity and difficulty it has during synthesis. Here comes the third direction, glycosylation, pegylation, and lipidation. There are three simple structures to show you how they look like. But in practice, other sugars, longer pack units, and other lipids are also feasible in this type of modification. Overall, these modifications make the molecule larger, improves the final target stability, and the circulation times gets longer. Therefore, they show better biological activities. Then we come to the fourth direction, adding functional motifs. Adding signal motifs like biotin or fluorescence dyes, those have been widely used and those reagents are commercially available. So on this slide, I want to focus more on improving cell permeability, because peptide delivery is also a hot direction nowadays. Compared to small molecules, peptides are much larger, and their cell permeability is not very good. Let's say your target protein is intracellular, but your peptide is poorly cell permeable. Then even your peptide is super potent in biochemical binding assay, it would show limited activity in cell-based assay, right? Then in this case, you need to consider cell-penetrating peptides. In this table, here are a few well-documented CPPs. Some are linear, some are cyclic, and some contain non-proteogenic amino acids. Last month, Dr. Tommy Sawyer reported a novel assay called NaloClick to quantify the relative delivery efficiency. And in the last column where EC50 value reported, the lower number actually indicates better cell permeability. And you can see cyclic CPPs show better cell permeability here. Then on the top right, there are two small cartoons to show you how the delivery system works. The top one is an exo ligation. Cargo and CPP are conjugated by a short linker. Then the second one is endo insertion, where the cargo is inserted into the cyclic CPP and makes the ring larger. So both strategies have been reported, and the efficiency is case dependent. Till now, you may still wonder how these modifications work. Then in the following slides, here are some case studies to show you the actual applications. OK, first case study, GLP-1 analog. GLP-1 is a human peptide hormone and stimulates insulin production. The main issue prevents GLP-1 as a drug is a lack of stability. It is rapidly broken by proteases and gets cleared. Semaglutide, which you have seen earlier, is an important analog of GLP-1. And this one, uh, as you may know, it has been proved by FDA already. Compare these two sequences, you will see only two modifications. One is the um, special amino acid replacement from aniline to AIB. And the other one is the lipidation on the lysine section, which is highlighted in red here in the middle of the sequence. 
These two modifications together result in great stability enhancement as well as improved efficiency. Then another great example in this category is called exanatide. Exanatide has been approved by FDA already. And this one is shows 53 sequence identity with GLP-1, very similar biological function, but much more resistant to protease degradation. The reason is that exanatide is a synthetic version of a natural peptide isolated from animal, non-human source. So our current projects include medical analog synthesis from exanatide. The residues highlighted in green here are the highly conserved helical region, and we didn't mutate those uh, positions. And the residues highlighted in light pink here are the positions undergoing SAR study right now. So that means they are mutated to other building blocks, including special amino acids we talked about before. The lessons learned from semaglutide case, I mean the AIB replacement and the lipidation on lysine, are also applied here. So thanks to current instrument and engineering technology, the synthesis gets much faster now. The high throughput automatic synthesizer can go up to 96 sequences in one cycle. Then let's say the target linear sequence is 42 amino acids. Overall, 8 to 10 working days would be sufficient for one synthetic cycle. And this, originally, it would take 30 to 40 days in the old days. So as you can see, this really enables the shorter SAR cycle. And we can quickly move into next round of design and get the favorable product faster. The second case study is about a complex peptide synthesis on solid phase. This is a bisaccharide peptide, both saccharization and amide bond. The actual sequence is even longer, but the key motif is like this. Two cyclic peptides connected by a few residues out of the ring. As you can see, besides the saccharization positions, there are other aspartic acid, glutamic acid, lysine exists in the sequence. Obviously, the orthogonal protecting groups need to be carefully chosen. And in this case, our initial attempts were using lysine analog and alleoprotected glutamic acid in the first ring during SPPS. Uh, when we reach the lysine in the first ring, we can remove the analog and allyl together, cyclize it on resin, then continue the SPPS, repeat the second ring construction. However, the second cyclization always failed. Even using different cyclization reagents, try in solution phase or in uh, or on solid phase, probably due to the unfavorable secondary structure after the first cyclization formed. So, how can we solve this issue? Finally, we came up with this idea: the synthesis of first cyclic ring on resin is okay, right? So we can keep this one. The second ring is moved to another pool of resin, synthesized independently on chloride resin, uh, cyclized on resin, cleave, and then expose the only one free carboxylic acid. The whole red building block is used in the first SPPS, then FMOC removed, continue the tail synthesis. This strategy has been successfully validated in this series, and we deliver more than 20 targets here. The previous case is about a fragment coupling on solid phase. Then here is the third case study about a fragment condensation in solution phase. Let's say you want your product to contain two motifs, or even more. Perhaps one is the CPP and the other one is your cargo, or one is a targeting molecule and the other one is like a drug. There are many possibilities you can think about. So the first point I want to draw here, there are different conjugation strategies you can choose, such as click chemistry, disulfide bridge, and amide bond. The second point is 
your marker can go really large in this case by applying this ligation strategy. And our most recent successful case is a 16KD mini protein synthesized via this methodology and it's bioactive after refolding. The third point, and which I think is the nicest part, is the combinatory chemistry can be applied here. For example, let's say you have two independent screening and you choose four motif A and three motif B. Then you want to figure out which combination would give you the best results. Instead of synthesizing each target one by one, you can prepare motif A and motif B in a slightly larger scale, then set up the ligation in parallel. Then very quickly, you can obtain 12 targets and compare those activity side by side. If your number of A and B is larger, then finally you will get a very big pool of candidates within a relatively short synthetic cycle. So in those examples I have shown here, I couldn't cover all problems we have met during our work. Here are some other general tips during synthesis, purification, and handling you can think about. First of all, when your peptides are really easy to form aggregates during solid pe peptide synthesis, you can consider pseudo-dipeptides as well as use a low loading resin. Um, for disulfide bond formation, the reaction time varies a lot. Sometimes two hours is sufficient, sometimes 40 hours is not complete yet. So please carefully monitor your reaction. For RCM and click, you may obtain two peaks with the same molecular weight. Then in a later stage where you need to figure out which one is which, it would be difficult. Coupling reaction on solid phase, some can be quick, some can be slow. Then you need to put extra attention to uh, DIC coupling condition, especially in large scale. Do not let it go too long. Regarding stability issue, we have met this problem with some peptides containing PEG units. Those peptides are sensitive to light at the base, so be careful during the process after private trialcy, uh, like lyophilization. The purity may drop after lyophilization. In general, phosphorylated amino acids are difficult to couple. You may need assistance from microwave here. Cyclic peptide synthesis is tricky. If you fail at one synthesis, you can always consider another cyclization site. The last point for purification process. C18 is always our primary choice, but it's not the only one. If C18 column doesn't give you good resolution, you can always think about C8 or C4 columns. Of course, the peptide synthesis is always case dependent. And if you really have trouble in one particular sequence for synthesis, Wuxi is happy to take the challenge. So the take home message here is that there are some general directions like special amino acid incorporation, cyclization, tagulation, conjugation with other motifs that you can think about to make your peptides more like a drug. However, there are no golden rules to guarantee those optimizations would finally make a heat compound into a lead compound. You may need to think multiple strategies, try different combinations, or even you, can, you will fail a few times to get to the right direction. Sometimes you also need to get assistance from computational chemistry. So good luck. Now I'm going to hand the control back to Andrew for new developments in peptide therapeutics. Thanks very much, Wei, for that overview of techniques, technologies, know-how, and understanding. I think it's interesting to note the sophistication in both the HIT ID platforms, exemplified by Graham's presentation on the orbit work, as well as the SAR development and optimization platforms described by Hui. We'd like to finish off with some new developments in peptides, 
combinations, constraints, mechanisms, and modalities. The first example involves a combination of multivalency with lipidation. Allosteric inhibitors were identified by a display technology, and the monomeric species were homodimerized to give an agent that had two orders of magnitude improved binding potency versus the parent monomer. In this case, the monomers are linked by a peg-based linkage, and in the middle you'll see a, a pandan lysine residue that has been palmitoylated to improve the pharmacokinetics of the species. Overall, the macrocyclic peptide homodimer exhibits potency, selectivity, and therapeutic efficacy in vivo. The next category we'd like to touch on concerns peptide drug conjugates. In this instance, we have at the far left the emerging modality example from the radial nuclide therapy space. It takes advantage of the known long legacy of somatostatin receptor binding strength and selectivity and attaches a pendant uh, ASA crown that contains the lutetium-177 radionuclide, which is in the business of emitting beta particles to treat tumors. The middle example is one that was touched on in principle by Hui in her discussion of the endocyclic delivery here. This is the uh, cell-penetrating peptide portion in black that you can see with the arginine residues and the naphthalalanine, whereas the biology end, if you will, for intervention is at the PIN1 enzyme, the peptidylprolyl cis-trans isomerase, where the phosphotreonine and the homoproline interact in the right way with the enzyme. So it's a combination. The third example is a recently approved by the FDA agent for treating relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. In this case, it takes the known 4-aminophenylalanine um, melaphalan alkylating agent and creates a peptide, peptide prodrug that, uh, as I say, was just recently approved as another example of peptide drug conjugates. The next example involves conformationally restricted peptides. On the left, aileron's agent, an alpha helix that is stapled with a hydrocarbon, produces an agent that is a dual MDMX-MDM2 P53 protein-protein interaction inhibitor and is an anti-leukemic agent. On the right-hand side, from the bicycle therapeutics platform that Graham touched on, we have a appropriately juxtaposed cysteine residues that alkylate the tribenzyl bromide to produce a bicycle linked through sarcosine, beta-alanine, and a disulfide to the mertansine DM1 toxin payload. The bicycle platform also involves tumor-targeted immune cell agonists, so-called TICAs, in which a specific tumor-targeting antigen bicycle is linked to a second bicycle that targets an immune agonist receptor. The final example involves cell-penetrating peptides, in particular an improvement in our understanding of the mechanism for endocytic uptake. This is non-receptor-mediated uptake. And importantly, it documents the Dehua-Pays group understanding of CPP12 on the right-hand side. You'll recognize, again, the arginine residues, the naphthalalanine linked to a payload. And it's all about better understanding how endocytosis via budding vesicles and the early and late endosomal escape uh, uh, are elicited mechanistically. And importantly, moving a highly polar agent from outside the cell to the cytosol. To summarize our presentation today, the key message is that a lot of the legacy barriers to peptide modality are eroding as novel techniques and technologies are discovered and insights accumulate. Speaking first to the display and Graham's presentation, 
peptide display platforms are now successfully integrated into both academic and commercial activities for hit finding. Large libraries are now possible, as Graham mentioned, and this includes, importantly, modified translationally and post-translationally modified peptides. Next generation screening encompasses the existing advantages that have been there since the days of phage, but adds an important new capability that includes the functional live cell screening. Overall, incorporation, as Hui mentioned, the non-proteinogenic amino acids, constraints, hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, all often in combination, really gives us a powerful optimization toolkit to apply. And as always, it's a question of creative solutions, overcoming long-standing challenges, uh, increases the number and the quality of peptide modality agents that are under investigation for therapeutic invention. Thank you very much to our co-presenters and all our listeners. Uh, we are about to begin the Q&A session and look forward to entertaining uh, any of the questions that the listening audience may have. Thank you all for that great presentation. Um, I'll just mention if you'd like a copy of the slides, please uh, reach out using the contact information that you see on this last slide. Um, and we now have time for some questions. Uh, first question is, can you also screen for C to N or head to tail cyclic peptides? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And, and thanks uh, for, for, for the great question. Yeah, most of the work at Orbit so far has been um, uh, uh, N to C uh, based uh, cyclic structures, but uh, uh, the, the head to tail would be feasible potentially. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've not deployed that uh, thus far. Great. Great. Thank you, Graham. Um, Someone asked, can the Orbit platform be used to identify inhibitors of protein-protein interactions? Yeah, no, thank you. Another good question. Uh, yeah, the, the off-bead capability where, bead, uh, where peptides are produced in the supernatant of wells or, or in droplets does open a number of different capabilities, uh, and uh, that can include the potential for protein-protein interaction inhibitors. Um, essentially, the Orbit platform is, is particularly um, attuned to the ability to detect fluorescent changes. If there's a fluorescent change, then uh, that, that, that assay can, in theory, be, uh, be deployed. So, so yeah, uh, the, 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 the Orbit platform could uh, feasibly be applied to identifying inhibitors of protein-protein interactions. Uh, another question has come in. Uh, what's the limitation on sequence length for peptides synthesized by SPPS? Yeah, I'll, I'll, this is Andrew, I'll take a, a, a jump here. So I think the solid phase synthesis that the team typically would work on as a maximum would go out to uh, as high as 70 residues. Uh, there are different ways to combine things, as Hui noted in her presentation. In some cases, we would break a longer sequence down into two individual um, portions or, if you will, um, smaller macrocycles in one case or fragments and really I think the the capability is uh, something that can go up to at least 70 maybe even as much as 100. Okay. Great. Uh, can anyone uh, comment on uh, the general limits of the platform in terms of the maximum number of residues that can be handled for synthesis isolation and purification? Yeah. I'll, I'll... Actually, I can handle that one. Oh, great. Thanks, Andrew. I can handle that one. Yeah. So basically, from a synthetic pro um, perspective, there is no limit. Um, it always depends on the yield, actual yield from the synthesis. So if the sequence is between 5 to 40 amino acids, normally the yield is pretty um, acceptable, I would say desirable. Um, but over 40 amino acids, the single SPPS would result in low yield, but you can still get something. And if the sequence is over 80 amino acids, 
Uh, we highly recommend you to consider fragment condensation, either by solid phase or solution phase. Um, but, uh, but everything uh, right now is possible to do. Great. Thank you, Hoang. Um, we have another question for you. Uh, what are the minimum and maximum scales of synthesis, isolation, purification, and consolidation that the SAR development optimization platform operate, operates on? Okay, so right now the minimum scale for SAR, I would say uh, in practice is 25 micromole resin. And if we consider the weight of the final peptide, it would be about 0.5 to 1. Great, great, thank you for that. Um, I think we have, uh, have, have covered uh, the questions. I'm afraid we're going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you again, uh, Drs. Routen and Liao uh, and Professor Og for your fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you to all the participants for being a great audience. Please be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for the replay of this webinar and for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Uh, thank you, On24, for technology and production services. And of course, our uh, thanks to uh, Wuxi Aptek for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNN Webinars, I'm Ann Thayer. Hope you all have a great day.